So I'm Alex Gonzalez. Um, originally, this presentation was well, going to be given by our senior developer, Kevin Murphy, but he actually had a concussion about a week and a half ago. So I'm, uh, I'm gracefully stepping in. So um, if you have any uh, questions at the end, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, so let me give you a little background on Kevin Murphy, because he is the man behind this presentation, man wrote the abstract. Um, he's our senior software developer. He kind of has his BS from Swarthmore College um, in mathematics. He does a lot of our genomics programming. Um, he's actually just finished working with our team to develop an iPad app, which allows researchers to browse genomic data uh, on their iPads, um, which is pretty cool. Um, he's been with our program for about 15 years. Um, and I kind of explain that a little later, um, what our department is. We're actually the Department of Biohealth, Medical and Health Informatics. Um, I am Alex Gonzalez. I'm obviously a lot younger than Kevin Murphy. Um, everyone jokes around because I'm always shadowing him like, like I'm his kid. Um, I'm actually a, um, a graduate from Temple University um, in mathematics. Um, I work at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and I work in a relatively new role called a data integration analyst. And what a data integration analyst does in our department is we work front end with researchers to essentially combine genomic, clinical, biomedic, biomedical, and laboratory data into our homegrown applications, which then we present to researchers and they can query, uh, query on. I'll get into that a little later. And who is CHOP? So Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, is the first United States pediatric hospital in the nation. We generally rank um, between one and two every year on the uh, U.S. News and, and World Report. We kind of have this um, thing going on with uh, Boston Children's. Every year they're one, we're two, we're one, they're two, they're two, they're one. So it's kind of like the Red Sox and the Yankees a little bit. Um, we're a top pediatric and research institution, um, 535 bed hospital with 55 plus um, ancillary care facilities. So we really do provide pediatric care to children in the region. I guess the, the, the interesting about Trins Hospital is we really are a patient first. Um, in a lot of hospitals um, in our region and, and throughout the country are relatively uh, concerned with, um, at the end of the day, obviously treating the patient, but you know, making a little profit margin as well. Um, the majority of our funding comes from research grants and grants from people in the area. So we really are kind of patient focused. Um, the majority of our work is truly trying to kind of help the children uh, that come in. Um, we have this pretty cool program um, where if a child's family come in for care and they can't pay for it, um, chop up with the bill at the end of the day. So we're really proud of our organization. So who are we? We are the Department of Biomedical and Health Informatics. We're relatively new. Um, department of, uh, within Children's Hospital. Um, we're kind of a four-pronged institution. Um, we have an application development team. And our application development team is they, per they developed homegrown applications, kind of I mentioned earlier. And this ranges from anything from genomic reporting to clinical reporting. Um, we also have a data reporting and management group um, where a lot of our researchers get um, research data information. Um, we have a genomic analysis group. We have a team of biomedical researchers and bioinformaticists. And what they do is they develop ways to sequence DNA, sequence genomes better, and query that information for researchers. And we have the fourth prong, which is what I kind of sit under, is the education wing. And we do a lot of um, outreach to, obviously, conferences talking about what we're doing, but internally as well. Um, we're really trying to push health and bioinformatics, which is a relatively new field within, uh, within healthcare as a whole. So I'm going to define some buzzwords um, that I'll say kind of down the road. Um, and, and these are kind of big, you know, big buzzwords in the industry right now. So uh, informatics. Well, informatics kind of has a very simple definition, but it encompasses a whole range of different applications and techniques, procedures. Um, it's using health information technology to improve patient care. Now that ranges from anything from, you know, using social media and reaching out to patients in that way um, to using electronic health record to try to improve patient care. Um, you may not know, but the, the federal government's doing a huge push now with that meaningful use to have companies across the country or healthcare institutions across the country implement electronic health records. And they're actually providing um, lots of money and um, in incentivizing. So what is bioinformatics? Well, bioinformatics is a little more, um, a little more dive down. That's very specific to genomic data. So essentially what researchers do in our institutions, institutions around the country um, is they sequence DNA and sequence different parts of the DNA um, a genome or an exome, and they determine what subset of that DNA causes a specific illness. 
or what subset of that DNA causes a specific phenotype. So this, this example I always give is I was actually in a genomic study a few years ago and what they did is they took, they took my DNA and they kind of look at it and I have Tourette's, they were looking for the Tourette's gene. So I was in a study with 300 different people where they actually sequenced our DNA and say, okay, well these, this subset of sequence of genomes, A, D, T, T, whatever, uh, thing, this is what causes or this is what we think causes this illness. Um, and we're doing that with congestive heart diseases, we're doing that with psychiatric diseases, we're doing that with cancer. Um, one of our big products I'll go into later, which actually uses the Postgres's foundation, is our Children's Brain Tumor Consortium project, and that has thousands of samples of children's brain tumors that have been sequenced and has clinical data surrounding it. So what researchers do is they go into our um, application and they say, okay, and I'll show you this a little later, they say, okay, well, I'm looking for children with this specific DNA subset, with this specific sequence subset, who have these specific characteristics, and let's run a study on them and see why um, they develop this illness and what we can do to treat it better. So we'll get into the reason why I'm here, um, why we really like Postgres. Um, well, we're not database, we're not DBAs, we're not, we're not, we're not database, we're database people, but we're not database people in, in the sense of database administrators. Why we really like Postgres is it's extremely high scalable and robust user community. I think the biggest thing about Postgres that we like as an institution is it easily has the best user documentation of any open source program, period. So we would look through Postgres implementation. Uh, we, we would use Postgres docs to implement our software. We would use Postgres docs, um, not only Postgres documentation, but the drivers surrounding it. So we use a lot of Python. So a lot of, our, a lot of the Python drivers and a lot of the things of that nature that communicate with Postgres is extremely well documented. Um, I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, open source is kind of a big deal for us. Um, every dollar we don't spend on an Oracle license and every dollar we don't spend on a Microsoft SQL license is one dollar that we can spend towards bettering children's care. And that's kind of big for us. So the thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars we save not implementing these and buying these licenses and associated support, we directly funnel into patient care. We funnel into researchers. We funnel into grants, which then researchers use to treat patients. And we find that a, a, a kind of our main mission. And, and we find that ex exceptionally important. And this goes without saying, I'm kind of preaching to the choir at this point, but the usability of Postgres is, is amazing. Um, I mean, someone can come in, we've had people come in, um, new level analysts who, who have used other database systems but have never used Postgres and come in and within a week and a half, two weeks, they're using PG Admin, they're using Navicat, and they're up and running. Um, it's, it's, it's extremely usable from an end user point. So and I'm gonna start talking about um, kind of the applications that we, that we use that Postgres powers. And this is kind of our big one. This is our flagship application we've developed over the last five or six years. Um, two of our main application developers, um, I'll go into who they are later, Byron Ruth um, is a major one. And essentially what this is is a, the Django powered web app that I kind of just talked about earlier where we put clinical data and genomic data into a, um, into a Django um, backend back in Power Web App, and we have researchers essentially query their own data in a de-identified way. So what does that mean? So HIPAA, health information, um, of, uh, essentially an um, action of the federal government which disallows people from using um, identified data in certain things. So we can't say, you know, Alex Gonzalez has this set of stuff, Alex Gonzalez has this set of stuff. We have to write an IRB and go through a bunch of research stuff. But if we de-identify all the data and say, I don't know who Alex Gonzalez is, I just know he has this stuff, we can stick in a reporting tool like this and actually design research studies around these query tools. And actually have a, we actually have a pretty cool demo set up. This is available. Uh-oh. Stuff like this always happens, right? Well, I have some screenshots there, that's good enough. So I was really hoping to show this, but it's, it's not opening up. I have some screenshots later. It's, it's a really cool research tool. But I'll, I'll just talk about some of the goals of Harvest and hope we have some screenshots going down the line. Um, so Harvest is a, unif a user interface which promotes discovery of underlying data, um, query without being forced into think in terms of relational databases. And this is the kind of a big thing, right? So if you're a clinician, 
you don't really care how data is joined in the back end. You really don't care how data is structured. You really don't care how data persists. You just want your data. So harvest is very easy friendly where you, you, kind, you, kind, of, you kind of go in the harvest and you have a, a series of filters, gender, uh, race, um, uh, disease location, et cetera. And researchers essentially all they do is click and drag and then that forms their cohort. So instead of asking our reporting team to write a, a query where give me all the male patients who have a specific heart defect at the health system and give me that now, um, they can go into their, they can go in the harvest and produce that cohort rather easily. Um, another major thing is a kind of familiar for most complex data. Um, our harvest tool exports um, data into Excel, SAS, R, CSV formats. So it's not only small sets of data, but we, and I'll kind of explain this later, there's, there's kind of large sets of data that we use. Um, we're actually in the consortium with 10 children's hospitals, I'll get into a little later, where we actually use this harvest query tool. And um, it's, it's, it's really cool, actually. So where does kind of harvest fall? You, everyone talks about these BI tools and, and all these intelligence tools that kind of exist. So flexible data model, fixed data model, you kind of have your business objects, cross reports. These, these things up there in, 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 in ITB2 are extremely hard to use for a clinician, extremely hard to use for an end user. We made Harvest extremely user friendly where even you guys, anyone, and I'll, and I'll send the link out later because I really want you to take a look. It's open source. It's, it's a wonderful program. I really want you to take a look. Anyone can go into their clinical data and, and query it in a very easy way. And, and that's, that was kind of the main thing we wanted to produce is, is an easy way to, to look at your data from a 30,000 foot view and produce a cohort which you can do a research study on. And that's the most important thing. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about a couple um, projects which we use Harvest on, but also is powered by Postgres. Um, so we are the um, uh, main data aggregators, as they like to call us, of a consortium of 11 hospitals. Um, and we essentially house all their pediat pediatric data. Um, 1.4 million unique patients, 120 million unique observations. What do I say when I mean by observation? A patient comes in for a visit, they have a specific diagnosis, they have a specific diagnosis note that goes along with that. Um, 40, 40 million visits, 10 million plus diagnosis. Well, what's the overall goal of PedsNet? Well, children's medicine is, is, is something where the federal government makes it even harder, obviously, to select specific cohorts because they're children. So if I ask a child to be um, consented on a research study, it, we have to go through a little more hoops to do that. Well, what does this do? This creates a huge de-identified data set um, which allows these 11 hospital consortium to query. So we have millions and millions and millions of records and someone sitting in Boston Children's wants to look at all the patients that we stuck in there from all 11 hospitals who have a specific congenital heart defect are between the ages of 10 and 12 and are Hispanic or African American. They can do that and they can get that de-identified data set and they can run, and they can run um, um, prospective studies and progressive analysis on those, on those different data sets. So why Postgres for PedsNet? Um, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with Docker, Dockerization? Yeah, yeah. So, so this is really awesome. And when we started using Docker a couple years ago, uh, we, it kind of changed our world a little bit. Um, the official Postgres um, Docker container, or Docker image is, is, is amazing and is extremely functional. And what, what we do um, with our, with what we do is we do a lot of spin-ups of testing. We do a lot of spin-ups of development. We kind of live in a world where we have a very short development cycle for, for what we consider um, any database schema changes. So we're working with different um, electronic health record systems, different vendors that have different database schema. So what we have to do at the end of the day is, is, is bring, it into a, bring it into a unified schema in our data warehouse. Um, but, but by using a, a dockerization where we can up and down Postgres instances rather easily, we have shortened our development cycle significantly. Um, our robust use is PLPG SQL for data manipulation and loading. This is really cool. Um, um, our Kevin Murphy, who again was supposed to give this presentation, um, he's written some pretty cool stuff with does a lot of bulk loading into, in, into our, um, into our PedsNet system. Um, we've been kind of given the entrusting role of, um, of, of doing this for all, our, uh, for all the 11 hospitals. They essentially send us CSV or flat file formats of their data, and we just, we just pipe, it into this, uh, pipe it into this data warehouse. Another reason we really like Postgres is kind of the easy authentication schemes. So we 
we attempted a while ago to, <laughs> to use MySQL and then have an LDAP type, Active Directory type um, authentication around um, MySQL. And it just was buggy as all hell. And we tried our best to get it implemented. We just said, screw it. We'll just try it in Postgres. We upped our Postgres um, LDAP. We, we upped our, uh, upped our Postgres um, um, instance behind our, um, behind our PEDS net for our internally within CHOP. Um, and we implemented LDAP. And within a week, we had Active Directory log on for, for, um, for the backend scheme. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. And just, it just that's, that story is kind of like told around the department is, one of the major reasons that, that we are going to continue using this open source product. And again, the user base. Um, we actually, um, the Postgres, uh, Postgres brick is actually really great. Um, this uh, audit trigger 91 specifically functions an audit function. We use rather robustly to audit all our data. And I kind of just want to like, say again, we're, we're not database administrators. We're not, we're not corely database people. Uh, most of the people in our department are kind of very, uh, come from either the uh, Python world or like a C-type language world. We're not, we're not people who kind of are more concerned about database things, we're more concerned about end user things. And, and having such a great user base where we can say, okay, I have no idea how to write this in, in a PLP to SQL, I need to go find it. You can go find it. And uh, it, it's pretty great in that respect. So the next um, kind of thing that we, that we use uh, Postgres to kind of back is a, is a, is a, is a query tool we, we developed called Verify. And uh, what Verify does is it looks at variant genomic data. Well, what is variant genomic data? 99% or 95% of the human genome is pretty standard. So we call it, like, we call it, it's, it's kind of it's genomic data that we know doesn't really concern ourselves with right now. There's this 5% of data that varies. And this 5% of the data are, 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 the, are the kind of stuff we're looking at. So for example, someone with threats in my example have a very specific subset of my DNA, which varies from a, that specific subset of your DNA. Well, we're, we, we want to concern ourselves with that. We want to say what specific variant in that person's DNA causes a child of four to have a congenital heart defect. What specific variants uh, of that child's DNA causes them to have a causing them to have a um, more, more susceptible to a brain tumor at the age of five or six. We want to concern ourselves with why that's happening. So what we wanted to do is we, we originally thought, okay, well, let's just put this in a relational database and, and it'll be fine. And we know that's a terrible idea because genomic data is huge. Um, to, to kind of give you an idea of how big Verify is, well, we have 16,000 or 1,647 data samples, but within that we have 300 million, um, we have 300 million um, kind of variant calls, and these are these these are these subset of DNA fragments that that vary. The problem with this is our database is huge. Kind of give you kind of give you an idea. The Library of Congress, all the data that's in the Library of Congress right now can fit into 15 terabyte 15 terabyte drive essentially. We have 47 terabytes of genomic data. That's a lot of data. So uh, we're kind of thinking, well, this is probably not a good idea to put in a relational database, but let's try to do it anyway. This is a few years back, um, before, the, before the whole, uh, four or five years ago, before um, a NoSQL became a, kind of a big thing, which is where we're moving towards in the future with the genomic data. But um, okay, well, how can, we, how, can we, how can we query this data? So we stuck what I talked about earlier, our harvest instance, our query tool around this genomic data. And it's very slow, but it works. So what a researcher can do, they can, they can go into our verify model and say, okay, I'm looking for, again, this subset of patients with this subset of variant that causes congenital heart defects. Go find me those patients. And you can go and find those patients. And, and, it's, and, it's, uh, and it's rather powerful. So why PGSQL or why Postgres? Well, this is, this is actually really interesting. We had this, we thought of a MySQL um, type thing, but we really like materialized views and, and kind of when we create our we can create our views having that data persist. And that's extremely important for when you query the data because it's not, it's not going and looking in those different tables, those tables that are uh, hundreds of millions record, hundred million record long and, and looking for a specific genetic variants. We can already pre-populate those views with the specific queries that we're looking for that we know research is going to look for instead of having those researchers hit go and have hours and hours and hours of waiting to query is a very specific small subset of variant data. I kind of just want to give you, this is relative, it looks 
relatively simple. It's not that big of a database. Um, what, what we really want to kind of focus on is it's, it's huge. And, and, and there's no other way to store genomic data in, in a small way. The human genome is, 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 is crazy. A hundred, one human genome can be sequenced, um, and it's a sequence probably can, can, you know, be hundreds of gigs. Just one human, one human genome, and that's, that's rather impressive. So, so I want to talk about a kind of a case study where we kind of incorporate this verify and this harvest that we talked about earlier. And what this does is incorporates clinical data with genomic data. So verify is strictly genomic, harvest is strictly clinical, and we did our best to kind of marry the two. Um, so what is PCGC? Um, the Pediatric Cardiac Genomics Consortium, and essentially it's a consortium of hospitals that are looking for congenital heart defects in children, and what they do is they send us, um, they send us um, um, exome sequences and genome sequences of, of their children, and we, we house it in our database. Um, again, I, I kind of mentioned earlier what, what variants are and what we do with this query tool. Um, the really cool part about this is this is the first time we did this on a multi-institutional level for children. Um, we have never had a d database or, or a consortium on the pediatric level internally um, which housed this much data and, and, and where we had the ability to go and actually marry clinical data and, um, and exomic data. And this is, this is what I wish worked earlier because it looks really cool. Um, so this is what PCGC is and this is what kind of marries that harvest thing I talked about earlier. Um, so you are a researcher and you can imagine logging into your research portal and go, this could be anything, PCGC, it could be, like I said earlier, Tourette study, it could be anything, it could be um, congenital heart defects. And you go, okay, well, I'm looking for um, male patients. So you click, researcher clicks on male and hits add to filter. So then, okay, add the filter, it tells me how many patients are there. Well, I really want patients that have a tissue location of the brain and the tissue stored at negative 80 degrees um, centigrade. And that's extremely important because when you house tissues at different, um, different degrees, quote unquote, if you house it at negative 80, it maintains RNA stability. If you house it um, in liquid nitrogen, it maintains DNA stability. And that's important. And then the variants. So if you click this pus button, this set of subset of variants you're gonna, are going to pop up of the specific variant associated with disease X, the specific variant associated with disease Y, click, click, and it auto populates here and then filters down. And the cool thing, this really makes everything great, you hit view results at the end and you get a subset of de-identified children. You get 100 or 200 or 300 people and you know where to form your, form your cohort. And you know that not only can you do studies and statistical analysis on that cohort, you have the ability to actually go back to the IRB, which is the Institutional Review Board, and what they do is they're the bridge between researchers and and research. So if, you, so if you want to run a research study on children, even adults, you have to go through a very strict process in order to get approval to make sure it doesn't harm the patient, et cetera. So you go back to the IRB and go, well, I found these 300 patients and they're de-identified. I'm going to write a request and I want you to give me all the clinical data. But you never would be able to know how many people you could ever have in a cohort. You don't know if that, um, um, that cohort even exists until you have a tool like this where you can easily go and query your data in a de-identified way. So why Postgres? Um, I think I kind of went, went to this earlier. Um, we're, we're huge fans of the, of the auditing trigger function. It's important that we, um, it's important that we maintain um, MD, kind of MD5 checking. This is extremely important when you want to when you want to ensure that the, the data that you have in your database, the data that we're getting sent, um, ha hasn't been audited or, audited or, um, or um, uh, not only audited but deprecated in any way. Um, and, and it's really interesting because we had a problem a few years back we were getting sent data from one consortium, one consortium member, and their data, their data was actually getting, um, data, data was getting corrupted on the way and before we instituted MD5 checking. Um, and, and then once, once we started MD5ing uh, the data and, and kind of the ideas associated with it, we were able to essentially say, okay, give me the manifest of everything you sent to us and we'll check it against our internal manifest to make sure um, what you sent us isn't corrupted. And, and this is, this is um, kind of something really cool because Postgres has that MD5 function natively, um, so we could easily MD5 our stuff. We also use MD5 in, in kind of like a, in a, in a, um, 
in a, in a um, more de-identified way. So if I have an MRN or medical record number, I can't actually present that to the researcher. We'd MD5 the, we'd MD5 some set of the medical number plus some other number plus some other, we MD5 of it. So the researcher never knows who that patient ever is at the end of the day. So future state, um, future state use, what's coming, what we're really excited about. Um, I said before, and I kind of want to start with number two, is foreign data wrapping, because genomic data sits better and is queried better in a non-relational way. There's actually um, companies out there, um, Curavos is one of them, and, and they're working on, on distributed platforms to query genomic data in a very fast and robust way. Google Genomics is doing a similar thing. Um, we're envisioning running foreign data wrappers to associate with them, with those, with those, with those um, distributed systems and those APIs to query genomic data in a very, uh, very fast way, um, and and kind of integrate it in a better way that we have now, where the genomic data sits in a relational database. And and the guy who developed, um, his name is Medi. Actually, the guy who developed um, Verify did a really good job of putting these variant calls in the database in such a way where you can query them in a relatively quick amount of time, but it's still way too slow. If I'm a researcher and I click there, I have to wait 10 minutes to query. 100 million things, I'd rather have it rather instantly. So we're really excited about that. And kind of other stuff everyone else is excited for, um, better query planning, JSON B data typing. A lot of our um, um, honest brokering, and if you don't know what honest brokering is, it's that de-identified part I talked about. Our, on, our electronic honest brokering is a total um, a, a, REST a, a REST API. So a lot, of, a lot of the things we have is, is stored in a JSON form. So the ability to store that in our database and query it in a better, um, better way is really exciting for us. Um, and just percent calculations, stuff like that. Um, aggregation filters, everyone else is kind of looking and go, wow, this is great. And very, uh, very native needs to be used for um, data analytics. Um, and last slide. And this is our team. Um, it's a rather big team. Um, but uh, kind of, um, our, like I talked about, our three prongs. I was looking for Kevin Murphy's picture. There he is. Yeah, this cool guy. So if you have any questions or positive presentation, call him. <laughs> and um, please follow us on, what was that? Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> well, I, I feel really bad because he called me up 10 days ago and goes, hey, I have this presentation. And I don't really have any many notes for it, but I really want to give it. And I go, OK, well, how are you feeling? He goes, I'm not really feeling. Why well, can you do it for me? I was like, OK, I'll go do it. So uh, this is like, so 10 days ago, I had no idea I was coming to this conference, giving this talk, but our director really wanted us to, to at least talk about something. So, we, we really, so I slapped kind of his notes together. But um, I really wanted to get the Harvest link to work, and I'm going to tweet it out and put it on, our, on the wiki, and I, it'd be really cool if you can go see it in action, because it really is an amazing, amazing tool, and, and it really can be used for not only genomic data, but other types of data sets as well. And we kind of envision this this harvest thing is we have this dream where we have like a thousand harvests where we have a ton of like de-identified data and we have a, a ton of um, we have a ton of researchers out there just kind of looking through the data in, in, in a very intuitive way because like I said before a clinician doesn't care that it takes me you know three hours to write their 15,000 mile sequence line SQL query to get their data they just care that they get their data and the fact that they can go to a tool like this and easily filter down their data in a very intuitive way that someone who's never touched SQL or, and not, never touched a relational database in their life can go into this tool and then do that, it, it's pretty cool. And um, it's something we hope that um, you know, other hospitals start using. Again, it's, it's open source, is on GitHub. So, so for PedsNet, are you thinking of referring to PedsNet? So, so we're kind of the brokers and everything. Um, we house everything. So it's, it's our harvest instance. Um, and essentially what you do is it's actually a really, really, really intuitive process is what you do is you essentially go and, and you sign up on our consortium. And oh, that's great. you sign up on our consortium and we know who you are because we know who you are and we say, okay, you're fine. So now you can sign up. So you have a username and password and you log on to our instance um, that way. But internally, like I said before, is the kind of the LDAP credential, credentials that we were using, and we really love that. Um, we really love the usability of that, because like I said before, we were working with MySQL in the past, and, and the LDAP stuff seems to be really buggy. So when we, when we started using Postgres uh, um, LDAP feature, um, uh, kind of LDAP and authentication to kind of ease a lot of our problems, and um, we were just able to go from there. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I really want this to work. Do I have a minute? All right. Uh, did I uh, did I uh, go a lot uh, did I go a lot faster than I was supposed to? Uh, let's open up my eyes. Yeah, I think I do. Um, so let's go to our main website. So oh, I thought I had my Wi-Fi working. So what you can do um, is go to our main website, and I'll tweet this out again. Um, and you go to uh, the harvest because it's like a harvest button. And you click it, and it just brings you up to kind of the harvest stack and explanation of what harvest is. And then what we did was we actually put up a public harvest instance around open source data, um, open public data, and you can kind of explore it that way. Um, oh, well, there you go. Things are really working out for me today, huh? Oh, there you go. So uh, can I take any other questions as I'm going through this? Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if there's a model for, I work with um, clients in the nonprofit sector around social services and things, and they have a lot of problems with proprietary tools and kind of get sucked into Microsoft ecosystem tools. And I mean, in some cases, they're the only solution for the particular areas that are doing social services for to these big agencies are these tools that are just horribly designed and horribly, you know, uh, horribly supported and everything. They're not technical people. What have you found? So you're working with So, I, so that's a really interesting question, and that's something we've kind of, uh, we've been really lucky as an institution where we've had a lot of um, support from administrative, kind of our administrative, like you said before, the suits and ties, where they really put together a, a Cracker Jack team that's not only very technical, but very forward focused. I think that type of data integration and that type of, um, uh, t t type of kind of showing data to people who don't really understand data, and that's kind of a big problem everywhere. And the thing is, we have this nice layer we have this nice layer, which is us, which kind of separates the hardcore data people with the hardcore like clinicians. So we serve as that layer, um, and we serve as that forward-facing, um, forward-facing end to the, to the clients. We call them clients, the customers of our pro of our programs. But I think that model, I think, it, and that's really funny because you know that's something I, I used to work at the University of Pennsylvania Health System, um, and that's something kind of you see everywhere and. There's no easy solution to kind of determining how to talk to clinicians in a way that they understand, and, and, and kind of bringing together data as a whole and presenting it. But the thing is, we actually are. We're hoping that these stacks and these solutions we make intuitive enough where someone with limited amount of programming experience, like limited Python experience, can up one of these harvest instances and put their data around it. The problem is we're not quite there yet, so we're not at the point where you can just take. Our harvest instance with no knowledge of the um, Django web frame, the Django web framework, or no knowledge of the Python of Python and and, and how and, and and up an instance around your data. Um, we're working towards that, and that's something we're hoping to have eventually. Um, but like you said, you kind of get sucked into everyone. Kind of gets sucked into the this whole you know we either have to be a .NET shop or we have to use Oracle because these are. We pay for them, so they have to be better, and they have to, they have to obviously, they have to, be, uh, have to be a lot more robust and, and have a lot better end support. But they aren't. I mean, that's what I'm finding. But yeah. It, it's, it's not only mm -hmm. is, it, is it not robust, is it not really meeting their needs, but then they're mm -hmm. paying so much license for it, and they're still having clients that will customize it and work on it. This is more like an open source system, right? We go in, working with the team, we're working with the, the forms or whatever else, even though they sell them as this oh, out-of-the-box solution and we'll help you customize or whatever, they're not yeah. Yeah, and the thing about Harvest is, Harvest is about, I say about 85% of the way there. What we did is essentially, we actually, there's an actually Harvest institution at the University of Pennsylvania Health System, which is um, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. What we did is we gave them the Harvest stack and go, here's the Harvest stack, you guys have some knowledge of programming, go. And they did, and they upped it, and we upped it, and we helped them a little bit upping it, but they upped it, and they got their data around it, and it looks really good. The problem with that is sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, and this is, 
you can, you can correct me from my experience at least, a lot of researchers, they want to funnel their grant money, in, grant money in a very specific way and it has, and they really want to funnel the grant money with, with things that have nothing to do with data. In their minds, data costs nothing. And data cleaning and, and data grabbing should cost very little. Like I enter the data, but then grabbing it should be a very free and easy process, and it's not. And I feel like, you know, we have, I've had researchers in the past um, kind of go, well, I don't know where to get the data, but they want me to not pay for getting the data that I created. But yeah, you have to pay, you have to eventually pay someone to pull it if you don't know how to do it. So I, I feel like there's that kind of intersection between kind of the, the research world and the IS world, and that, that, that kind of overlap is where we sit at CHOP. And we're doing our best to <laughs> not charge researchers at this moment, but as we become more strapped cash, like I said before, every dollar that gets put into the Department of Biomedical and Health Informatics is one dollar that doesn't get put into a vaccine for a child. So we do our best to cut costs and maintain, but not only do that, but maintain a very competitive organization. But that's, you know, that's the question that we're all trying to solve. And that's, that's so hard because you, and I could be blabbering, but you, you I, I've met with researchers who go to like an electronic health record, like a reporting team and say, well, give me this report. I want to see all this. And the reporting team has no idea what the hell you're talking about. Like you could say, you could say, I want this ICU-9 code and this specific thing, and they don't speak that language. So I feel, I feel like there needs to be more of a need for researchers to see, well, you need to either find someone who understands that language or you need to start understanding their language to get your data back out. But this is Harvest, so, um, so, so in this case, like, this is, this is everything that's in your database. Sorry, the, it's kind of wonky. Um, this is everything in your database. So in this current database, we have 3,720 patients that the birth date is, um, is estimated at 1,565, which it's not. So I can go, okay, well, I want everything that, that isn't, and I hit apply filter, and I have all these patient gender is male, and diagnosis name is whatever, and then I go view results. And what this does is this goes back and queries the data and goes, okay, well, give me that entire data set. And if I wasn't on such a small screen, it will work because I'm giving, oh, zero patients, that's why. Okay, two patients. So you go view results, and then it spits out kind of, you know, this is de-identified, but this is open, this is open data for anybody who wants to go see it. Um, this is their age, this is their gender, and you can go and download that information. You can go and download it in any format you want. Um, go back to the query, all that other stuff. Um, it, it's, it's pretty neat. Um, it's kind of like, like I said, this is, this is very simple to use if you're a clinician. So I go, oh, well, I'm a clinician, I want this. Well, oh, well, clearly I want this, you know what I mean? Or, or clearly I want, you know, it makes, it makes a lot of sense to kind of look at your data on 30,000 of you and, and kind of instead of saying, well, left outer join to the diagnosis table where on blah equals blah, a clinician just can go and go, oh, I want to look at all the white blood cell counts and look at the distribution of my cohort. And I want to look at all the patients that are male and all that other stuff. So um, we're really hoping that this kind of takes off. But like you said, and you made a really, really good point. We're about 85% of the way there to where we make it extremely automated. We haven't automated it to the point where you can just say, give me a CSV file and it'll port, because we still have a relational model, so you have to have some type of you know, understanding of, of how a relational model works. So any other questions? So another question, and verify you said there's some aspect of the delivery flow. Is there any technical things that you identified that would, that would be very useful for the process to move to the Well, that's, that's interesting. Okay. It's, it's very slow because of the nature of genomic data. Um, the nature of the complexity of genomic data. It's essentially one field with hundreds of thousands of characters. And that's just something that just doesn't work well in a relational database, regardless of what relational database you're in, because it's just the nature of the vast complexity of how genomic data is structured. So I think the big thing what we really like about Postgres and the thing we're really interested in is we really like our harvest stack. We want to keep this on top of a Postgres model, on top of the Django framework. What we're really looking at now is foreign data wrappers and how, we, how can we access non-relational databases and query non-relational databases in a SQL-like way that the Django framework can recognize. And then we can get really fast, robust queries of genomic data in a rather, in a, in a rather robust, and agile, um, robust and agile way. And I, and I think that's just the nature of genomic data. And that's why, um, like you were saying with Hadoop and, and, and Google Genomics, everything seems to be moving towards this. Um, non-relational structure, which works really well for how genomic data is structured. So. Can you explain a little more just detail in the Harvest open source database 
I'm sorry? Yeah, uh, and and we do, and I think kind of I think kind of the big thing is I want to kind of circle this back to how genomic data is structured, because not only do you have genomic data, like so, so you have you get your exome, which is a very small set of your genome. It's the ex, the smart part of your genome that actually encodes proteins, and and you get that you get that um, sequence. But then what the machine actually spits out and what you actually do through your, your, your um, kind of post-genomic sequencing processes is you get all these annotations. So you get, you know, at line one million, um, that protein does this. So we get these, you know, vast amounts of, vast amounts of data, which we just kind of throw into a database. And, and honestly, at, at this point, um, Verify is great. But it's it's not being used as much as it should be being used because of how slow it is. So I think honestly, at the end of the day, we're going to move to a we're going to move to a kind of this type of stack with a the NoSQL model. Right, we're not using any NoSQL right now. We really we're waiting for um, companies like Curavos um, that and, and Google Genomics. And, and kind of how they're, because Google Genomics, every few years, they want to take a stab at genomic data, and they kind of stop for a little bit, and then they, three years later, it's like, well, we want to do genomic data again, and they start working on it again. Um, we really want uh, companies to develop uh, their, 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 um, their kind of non-structuring, as I like to call it, and, and how they query genomic data so we can access kind of their, uh, their development and their framework in, in, a, in a kind of a foreign data rep or API type way. There's this company, like I said, Curavos, called Lightning API. They just got this grant. There's this, like, um, um, it's actually really cool. There's this kind of, like, race to whomever can um, find a way to search the specific subset of genome sequences the fastest, and whoever gets that kind of gets this, like, kind of gets this award, and we're kind of just sitting back and say, okay, you guys go, and then whoever gets it, it's going to be open source, so we're just going to access that. So. But we really, right now, everything's in a relational way. But um, clinical data is great in a relational way because the data is not nearly complex enough where it, it causes a lot of, you know, and, and, and clinical data in any EHR system is structured in a relational way, so it's really easy to adopt those type of data models into our data models and port that data over easy, um, over pretty easily. But when it comes to genomic data, it's a whole different story, and that's a problem the whole world's trying to, biomedical world's trying to solve right now. Yeah. They went out. And that was a situation actually where like city agencies were really encouraging nonprofits to go with all sector and saying, oh, it's great, we'll do everything, and then all of a sudden they're gone. Um, so I, I think that's made nonprofits and their people in the space kind of really wary of going with someone. But for you guys, you have a plan. You're, you're going forward and really yeah. looking forward to the long We actually just um, won a grant from the, um, uh, from the federal government. I think it was, it was NIST. We got a $700,000 grant for, um, and they said, okay, well, this is, a lot of the stuff, what you do is great, so here's $700,000 to continue the funding of your department, and we actually just got it. The thing is about children's hospitals is that we have millions of donors, and that give us tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to further patient care. So in this, in our mind, this has a, this could have a really positive impact on patient care, so we're going to keep developing it until it gets to the point where researchers can just take this and take their data and spin up an instance. So. Having that ability to go back to our administrators and go back to our people and say, okay, we want to do something like this, really like, allows them to say, okay, well, we can keep doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but well, we, like to, we like to make it specific to children so our donors go, oh, yeah, it's specific to children. This is great. Um, and, and, and to be honest with you, we've had a lot of positive feedback. And my job specifically is to help researchers design data models that can be put into a harvest instance and, and, and kind of integrate their data from their different sources and throw it in the here from limb system, from a clinical system. And we have a lot of people in the health system going, wow, this, is, this could really work for me. Um, this could really work for our study. This could really work for our consortium. Um, there's a huge, 
I don't know if you guys have ever heard of REDCap. It's research data capture. It's this, it's this, it's this form that was created out of Vanderbilt that has a MySQL backend, and this essentially just this form, and like it's like literally all it is is research data capture. So you'd say it's basically just like a bunch of like forms, and the research data person fills them in. It's it's okay, but it's it's kind of terrible when you outport stuff. So researchers need a lot of help, and we're lucky enough to have the funding to go help a researcher take their. 600 field spreadsheets and stick them into a relational database and, and put up a harvest instance on it. But our hope is that one day, um, you know, we don't have to do that, where a researcher, a researcher can take the harvest stack and say, okay, well, I understand how the harvest stack works. It's pretty automated for me. I understand that it's, you know, it, it incorporates these different sources. Let me just up the data. I'm just gonna, you know, hit the button and it works. And we may never get there, and I personally don't think we'll ever get there because research data is too mutable and research data is too dynamic. But we can get 95% of the way there. Thanks.